All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is John. I know you were expecting Pastor Josh. We look just alike. That's what we hear. Um, but that's my brother from another mother and another father, brothers in, <laughs> brothers in Christ. Uh, but my name is John, and I serve on a team here at One Hope. And I'm so thankful and excited to share God's word with you on here today. Um, before I dive into the word and tell you a little bit more about myself, I want to take an opportunity to honor what I believe are some of the greatest leaders in Pastor Josh and Amber. Can we give it up for our leaders? I'm so thankful for them. And I just don't say that to say that. Like literally a couple years ago when my wife Amber, my wife's name is Amber too. I want to clarify that. Um, <laughs> my wife Amber and I, you know, we got a chance to meet Josh and Amber, the other Amber. And uh, we just connected so well with them. We fell in love with their hearts and who they were. So we knew, like before we even visited this church, we knew this is where we were supposed to be. And I remember my wife and I pulling up. We were still worshiping, meeting at the school. And we pulled up. And I told my wife, I said, look, this might be a crazy church. I don't know. But I love Josh and Amber so much that we're going to go here. This is where we're supposed to be. And then we came in, and it was amazing. So I was like, thank the Lord. Whew. Um, <laughs> nothing crazy was going on. But um, we love them so much, and we honor them so much. So I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share God's word today with you. I also want to honor my beautiful wife, Amber McCann, who's sitting on this front row. Yo, I love my wife. That's my best friend. I love you so much. Thanks for praying for me. Thanks for holding me down. Thanks for putting up with my mess. Literally, my office looks like a mess right now, and she still loves me. Um, so I'm so thankful for you. Can we say all? <laughs> Bonus points for me. <laughs> uh, but no, I'm super thankful for her, and I also am thankful just for all my family and friends who are here today and for the um, One Hope um, staff and just everyone. I'm so thankful to share God's word with you. Today's a special day for me because I got called into the ministry 11 years ago, uh, March 5th. And for the last 11 years, I've had the opportunity to minister and to preach in so many different contexts. But to be able to preach here at my home, I'm super excited and super pumped and super thankful. Um, so there is a word from the Lord. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. If you don't have your Bible, don't worry. We're going to put it on the screen. Um, and while you turn there, um, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but recently it started getting really hot outside. How many people like the heat? We're going to pray for all of y'all. Y'all all need prayer. I don't like the heat, but every time it gets warm, it reminds me, every time we get into the spring or summer, I get reminded back to spring of 2017 where I had a buddy of mine who had a sailboat and he kept saying, John, I want to take you sailing. Now, I grew up in Kenner. Kenner in the building? <laughs> Represent Kenner City, Kenner Um I grew up in Kenner. So we grew up by the lake, and we went to the lake, but we never went on the lake. Um, so I was like, I don't know if I'm going to go sailing with you. But he kept asking me, come on, John, let's go sailing. So I was like, okay, I'll go sailing. But I was like, if I'm going to go sailing, like, we got to turn this into an experience. It, gotta be, it has to be awesome. So we get some crawfish from Deanie's. Anybody know about Deanie's crawfish? It's anointed. It tastes so good. So we get us some crawfish from Deanie's, and we get the music together, and we're so excited. We're going to go sailing. So we get out there on the boat. It was a big group of us. We're in the middle of Lake Ponchi Train. He lifts up the sail, and guess what? There was no wind. I said, man, you got me out here in the middle of the lake looking crazy. Like, there's no wind. Like, we're not sailing. We're sitting. You know, it's like, I thought we were going sailing, not sitting. Um, so anyway, we were out there, and I said, well, look, while I'm out here, we might as well get a little video of me jumping in the lake and swimming, you know, because if it's not on Facebook and Instagram, it didn't happen. Um, I used to think that way. The Lord delivered me. Um, but he gets the camera, and I, I jump into the lake, and, I, and I, get, I swim back up, and I said, did you get it? He's like, yeah, I got it. And I was like, great. And then guess what? Out of nowhere, this huge gust of wind comes. And this sailboat starts, like, jetting. And, and I don't have a life jacket on. So they're like, John, swim. I was like, okay. I was trying to swim to catch the boat. I couldn't catch the boat. So there I was in the middle of Lake Ponchi Train. The boat was getting further and further away. And I was just thinking to myself, I heard Lake Ponchi Train has sharks. <laughs> and I heard the sharks like dark meat. <laughs> I'm like, I'm about to get eaten alive. My mom is going to turn on the news and see, like, 
giant gets eaten by a shark in Lake Pontchartrain. And I was sitting there, and the boat kept getting further and further away because they couldn't start the engine. And there I was, and I wasn't a, sw- a strong swimmer, so I, w- I was really like doggy paddling the whole time, <laughs> trying to stay afloat. And then what after felt like, it felt like like 20 to 30 minutes. The people there say it was only like five to seven minutes. <laughs> but to me, it felt like 20 to 30 minutes. Finally, they got the boat on, and they came back, and they rescued me. And I got in the boat, and I literally was red. Because, like, that's how much energy I had to pump just, like, to stay alive. And I get in the boat, and I, and I survive, and now I'm here to tell the story today. Isn't the Lord good? Uh, but, <laughs> but I tell that story because when I was in the water, I felt like I was in an impossible situation. I was in a tough situation. I was in a situation where I was full of fear I was anxious, and in that moment, I had to make a decision on whether or not I was going to feed into fear or whether or not I was going to feed into faith. And I believe with all my heart, there are so many people that are here today, and if you're honest, you might find yourself in a tough situation. You might be in a tough situation as it relates to your family, as it relates to your kids, as it relates to your marriage, as it relates to your job, as it relates to your career, as it relates to your health, as it relates to you just going through the motions of life and just going through it and not having any passion or any zeal. You might be in a tough situation as well. And the question is, are you going to feed into faith or are you going to feed into fear? And as I was praying, the Lord laid a word on my heart for you, and he wanted me to remind you that as you are navigating life and as you are in these tough situations, he wanted me to remind you that he is still the God that knows where you are. He is still the God that loves you, and he is still the God that is pouring out his spirit. He's pouring out his spirit on the earth. He's pouring out his spirit in this church. He's pouring out his spirit in your situation. And you can't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. And as you look and you study scripture and you see the the New Testament word for spirit, it means a current of air or wind. And when you look in the Old Testament and you see the Greek word ruach, which means spirit or wind. So as I was praying, the Lord wanted me to share with you from the topic of a fresh wind. A fresh wind. I don't know about you, but is there anybody here that can say, John, if I'm being honest, I need a fresh wind. I need a fresh wind in my marriage. I need a fresh wind in my relationships. I need a fresh wind on my job. I need a fresh wind in my career. I need a fresh wind of my health. I need a fresh wind of my finances. I need a fresh wind with my life. We need a fresh wind of God's spirit. And as we look at this text on today, we're going to see and read about a story where God's fresh wind shows up. Because I believe with all my heart, I don't know what your situation might be on today. I don't know where you need God's fresh wind. I don't know where you need God's restoration. I don't know where you need God's hope. I don't know where you need to increase your faith. I'm not sure where you are today, but I believe that you're not here by accident, but God sent you here because he has a fresh wind of his spirit that he wants you to tap into. And we're going to begin reading Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 10. And it says, The hand of the Lord was on me. And he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. So I'm going to keep reading, but I want you to know what's going on. We're reading um, from Ezekiel. Ezekiel was an Old Testament prophet, and we're reading his story. So the Lord takes him and in a vision places him in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. Then he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And then he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. 
This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise. Somebody say noise. A rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Wow. And the word of the Lord is blessed. What a vision that Ezekiel has. So a little bit of context here. Ezekiel, he was an Old Testament prophet. And this is happening during the time that the children of Israel were in captivity. They were in Babylon. They were in captivity for their disobedience. And they were away from home. They were in a situation that they were uncomfortable with. It seemed like it was impossible. It seemed like all hope should have been lost. They were there because of their disobedience and their sin. But they were a foreign territory. And in the midst of this, God calls up a prophet, Ezekiel, and gives Ezekiel this vision. And as we remember and as we lean into this truth that God's spirit still wants to pour out in our lives, it's a couple of biblical truths that we can pull from this text. So if we want to position ourselves to make sure by God's grace that we don't miss his fresh wind, there are a couple things that we must remember that we can pull from this text. So the first thing we must remember, and you can see in verse 1 and 2, is that God is concerned. If you're taking notes, and you're like, Pastor, I I want to make sure I don't miss this wind. What do I need to do? Because some of you, if you're honest, you're like, I got a bunch of dry bones in my life. Be honest. Like, you don't know the dry bones I have. You want to make sure you remember what we pull from this text. First thing is that God is concerned. So the children of Israel, they end up in this situation due to their disobedience. And it seemed like they were in an impossible situation. And God is so concerned with them that he calls Ezekiel and he gives him this vision for their future. And what we got to remember is that no matter how dry your bones are, that God is concerned. And I want to encourage you with this because this is so huge in this text. The children of Israel, they had sinned against God. They had rebelled against God. And in the midst of that, God still is concerned about them. And the truth here that I want you to hear from me loud and clear is that it does not matter what you have done. It does not matter how bad you have been. It doesn't matter what sin you have committed. You cannot outrun God's love. God still cares for you. And somebody needs to remember that today because the enemy will make you think that you've disqualified yourself of God's love. You can't disqualify yourself from God's love. God's love is not uh, determined by your actions. It's determined by his character. And God cares for you. He's concerned. And I love this text because it says he's in the middle of a valley and it was full of bones. Then he continues on. He says they were very dry bones. So anybody know what bones represent? (laughs) Death. Oh, I thought I was coming to church to get a smile on my face. Death. (laughs) But these weren't just bones. These were very dry bones. So they were like dead, dead, you know. (laughs) Like it was over. And for us, it's important to to see this and recognize this because some of us have some dry bones in our life that seem like so much time has passed. It seems like so much damage has been done. It seems like the situation is so impossible. And if we're not careful, we can fall into the lie of thinking that our bones are too dry for God. We can fall into the lie of thinking that our bones cannot be restored. But the truth of the matter is that the God that we serve, he cares for you. He cares for you. I don't know what your dry bones are. 
Your dry bones might be something in your marriage. It might be something in your relationships. It might be something at your job. Your dry bones could just be that you're going through the motions of life. You have no sense of direction and purpose. Your dry bones could be you used to have a dream. You used to have passion. And all of that stuff is in the background. I don't know what your dry bones are. But you have to know that God is concerned. So this reminds me, like, I used to work at a restaurant called La Trobe. It was like an event center. And at this event center, they threw a lot of weddings. And this is where I discovered that people will spend a whole mortgage for a house on a wedding. You know who you are. Some of y'all are in here. And at, at this venue, people will spend like $200,000 for a wedding, $300,000 for a wedding. And I said, what in the world? I said, man, I could have threw you a wedding for 10000 and kept the rest. You know, like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, but they would spend all this money on these weddings. And I was a server at this venue, and I was so proud to be a server. I would show up early, and there was like a tier. So it was like you were a server, and then if you did really good as a server, you got a promotion to a food runner. And I just wanted to be a food runner so bad. So I remember I showed up to work on time, and I would serve everybody with a smile on my face. I was super excited, and with one month, your boy got a promotion. Yes. I was like, I was promoted to a food runner. I was so excited. You couldn't tell me nothing. I was like, I'm a food runner. Y'all, yeah, y'all are just servers. Yeah, check your boy out. I'm a food runner. You know, I was super excited. And one of my first days on the job, um, I was going and running the food back and forth from the kitchen to the dining area. And I go into the kitchen and the chef says, John, I need your help. Can you take that soup and heat it up? And I was just so honored. It's like, the chef, the chef wants my help. I was excited, the chef. I was like, anything, anything, chef, whatever you want, I'll help. So I take the soup, and I take the soup, and there was an aluminum pan there. So I pour the soup in this aluminum pan, and I open the microwave, and I put it in the microwave, and I put five minutes, and I put start. And I was just so happy. I was like, I'm helping the chef. I'm helping the chef. I was so excited. And then out of nowhere, my manager comes like, I mean, a full-blown sprint across the kitchen and pushes me out the way and opens the microwave and is like, John, what are you doing? I said, I'm heating up the soup. I'm helping the chef. John, you can't put aluminum in the microwave. I was like, oh, you can't? <laughs> like, you're going to blow up the kitchen. I was like, oh, I didn't know. And the reason why I tell that story is because that manager was so concerned about me that he came running in my direction and he pushed me out the way because I was putting myself and everyone else in danger. And the word of the Lord for you today is that you might be in a situation where you feel like God doesn't care about you, but the spirit of God is running towards you. He's running towards your marriage. He's running towards your sickness. He's running towards your brokenness. He's running towards that impossible situation. And sometimes it won't feel good. But it doesn't mean he doesn't care. You think it felt good when he pushed me out the way? I was ready to fight. It's like, I wasn't as full as I am now, but <laughs> if I could just go back in time, I would have punched that manager in the face. Um, this is before the Lord worked on me. Y'all are judging me. Um, but, 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 but anyway, that was not comfortable. And sometimes God might have us in situations where it's not comfortable, but it doesn't mean he doesn't care. He's concerned, and he's running towards you, and he's running towards those dry places because he cares about you. 1 Peter 5 and 7 says, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. He cares about you. That's huge. So simple, but so profound that the God of the universe cares about us. The next thing that we must remember from this text is that God is powerful. If you look back at verse 3, God asks Ezekiel, he says, Son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel responds, uh, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. I think this is kind of funny. God's like, hey, Ezekiel, see these dry bones? Can they live? I feel like it was a trick question. Ezekiel is like, you're Lord. I mean, you know the answer, God. You know, that was a great answer. But what he realizes is that he's talking to a God that's powerful. 
And we have to remember that we serve a God that is powerful. This question of can these bones live again is a question of faith. Your dry bones, whatever they are in your life, I have a challenge and a question for you. Do you believe that they can be restored? Do you believe that we serve a God who has enough power to restore whatever brokenness or impossibilities that you're facing in your life? Do you believe that you serve a God that no matter how long it's been, he has the power to restore, to reignite, to realign you on the purpose that he has called you to live? And a lot of times what happens is Ezekiel recognizes how powerful the God is that he's talking with. And a lot of times for us, if we're not careful, we end up magnifying the problem and minimizing God's power. That's what the enemy wants us to do. He wants us to magnify the pain, magnify the dysfunction, magnify the addiction, magnify the fear, magnify the anxiety, magnify the fights, magnify all this stuff and minimize his power. But the devil is a liar. The God that we serve is more powerful than any problem that you might have today, any problem that you might have had yesterday, any problem that you might have tomorrow. The God we serve is more powerful. We have to remember his power is greater than our problems. Ezekiel recognizes how powerful God is. Do you recognize how powerful God is? We're talking about fresh wind. The fresh wind that we're believing for God's spirit to pour out in our lives in the dry areas. But do you believe that God is powerful? And as I think about this truth, I remember a time where I dealt with, like, having a problem and then having to interact with somebody that has some power that can do something about the problem. So anyway, my problem was I was anointed with something called a heavy foot. Now, (laughs) some of you all know what this means. Some of you don't. An, uh, An anointed heavy foot is when you get in the car. You don't even have to try. Somehow your foot just gets heavy. And you just go boom, and you go from zero to 100 on the, on the I-10. How many of my heavy footers are in the building? Yes. I was a heavy footer. And I remember I was driving down airline one day, and I, whenever I saw the speed limits, those who of us who are anointed with heavy foots, we recognize the speed limits as recommendations, <laughs> not requirements. And I was driving down Airline Highway, having a good old time, going 70 to 80 miles per hour, (laughs) zooming in and out the traffic. I was like, yeah, baby, I'm rolling. Um, Until I got a ticket. Cop pulled me over and was like, sir, you're going 79 degrees in a 40 miles per hour zone. (laughs) I was wild. The Lord delivered me. Um, But I had a heavy foot, so I had to go to court. And I remember... It must have been the Spirit of God, I was in college, told me to put on my high school t-shirt. Now, if you don't know, I went to what I believe to be one of the greatest high schools in this city, and that is Jesuit High School. (laughs) Anybody from Jesuit High School in the building? Hey, we got three of us. Praise the Lord. The first service didn't have any. (laughs) So I put on my Jesuit high school shirt, and I go to court, and I walk up, and the judge is reading off everything, like, oh, like, this fast, you know, your record, all this other type of stuff. And then she looks up at me, and she says, oh, you went to Jesuit. I said, yes, ma'am. I did. She says, my son went to Jesuit. And I said, oh, I bet he's a wonderful young man. She said, he is. I said, I know, I know. He's a wonderful young man. I'm sure he's doing great in life. She says, let me tell you what. I'm going to take this speeding ticket, and I'm going to throw it out. You're not going to have to pay for it, and it's not going to go on your record. But just promise me that you will not speed no more. And I said, yes, ma'am. I lied. But, <laughs> but 
I tell that story because that judge had the power to say one word, and that one word that the judge said had enough power to fix the problem that I had. So if that earthly judge had the power to say one word to fix the problem that I have, how much more powerful is our God in heaven that spoke the earth into existence? If he could just say one word, it doesn't matter how big your problem is because he is more powerful. One word. It doesn't matter how dry your bones are. It doesn't matter how impossible it might seem. It doesn't matter how long you've been pursuing whatever it is that the Lord has placed on your heart. We serve a God that's powerful. Don't magnify your problems more so than you magnify God's power. We serve a powerful God. How powerful is he? We see that God's power is unlimited in Scripture. It's unlimited. God's power is unlimited. So what else can we pull from this text as we think about making sure that we position ourselves to experience the fresh wind of God? We also can see in this text that God's word is alive. Verse 4 says, Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is powerful. These dry bones don't come back to life because of Ezekiel's words. These dry bones come back to life because of the Lord's words. And for you and I, we have to understand that there is power in God's word. There's power in his word. And if we're not careful, we can end up thinking that if we lean into these other sources, you lean into your favorite podcaster, you lean into your favorite um, person on the TV, whatever the case might be, you lean into your favorite news station, you lean into that influence, whatever the case might be, that they can help save you. They can't help save you. Their power compared, is nothing compared to God's power in his word. His word is alive. His word is alive, and for some of us, that's the word for us today. If we want to experience God's fresh wind in our lives, we have to stop thinking that we can do it on our own. We have to stop thinking that we can figure it out on our own. We have to stop thinking that we can talk to our friend and get the answer. No, we need to talk to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we need to see what he says in his word so that we can experience the fresh wind of God. Again, something so simple but so profound, and I get it. We're all busy, and sometimes it's hard to prioritize that time in God's word, but it's so important for us to do that. I get it. Like My wife and I are both realtors in the city, and we deal with some crazy clients. (laughs) My house is worth $400,000. No, it's not. (laughs) No house on this street has sold over $200,000. You're not getting $400,000 for this house. Amen. Yes. (laughs) Um, but I get it. Like, I'm busy too. But I understand and recognize that God's word is alive. I recognize that that is the power that we have to pull from. Sometimes, I'll be honest with y'all, sometimes I only got like five minutes because I'm rushing. I just open the Bible app and I read the, the verse of the day. That's something. And I don't know where you are with your time in God's word, but for some of you, that's the word today. Get back in that word. Start opening up the word of God because it is alive. And stop plugging into all these other things and start plugging back into the absolute truth that's found in God's word. I remember growing up, I always wanted to have like the best, coolest house on the street. I wanted my house to look better than everyone else's house. Anybody else like that growing up or currently? Okay, a few of y'all. Y'all know y'all competitive. Y'all want y'all Christmas lights to look better than the neighbor's Christmas lights. You don't got to have no shame in it. Uh, that was me. I, I took a lot of pride in it. I remember one time I was helping my, my dad. We were setting up all the Christmas lights. And, I mean, we were about to put the neighbors to shame. That was me. I was like, oh, you think you got some lights? Wait, wait, just wait, just wait. Um, and we had everything set up. And my dad says, Jay, plug in, the, plug in the outlet. Plug the plug in. So I plug in the outlet. And guess what? No power came on. My dad said, plug it up, son. He said, Dad, I did plug it up. What was wrong was 
that outlet had no source. It looked like it should provide energy, but it didn't. So I had to find another outlet. And for many of us, we are plugging into all these other things that look like they're going to provide us power, look like they're going to provide us truth, look like they're going to provide us stability, look like they're going to provide us peace. We are making gods out of everything else except the one true living God in heaven. And we have to remember that his word is alive. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. As we embrace the fresh wind of God, we must remember that God's word is alive. And then the last thing that we can pull from this text of biblical truth that we must remember is that God restores, that we serve a God that restores. Some of us need to be reminded of that because our dry bones are so dry, but we need to be reminded God restores. As you look at verse 10, Ezekiel says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Wow. These dry bones, these very dry bones, not only got flesh, but then had breath and stood up as a vast army. And this was symbolic to what God was going to do for the children of Israel. And as you study the text, you will find out that after 70 years of being in exile, God restores the children of Israel. And the same God that restored the children of Israel then is the same God that can restore us today. The same God that restored them back then is the same God that can restore your marriage today, your family today, your health today, your brokenness today, your sin today. That's the same God that we serve. And I don't know what you need restoration in. Some of us need a fresh wind on our jobs. Some of us need a fresh wind in our spiritual lives because we've been going through the motions. But if we're honest with ourselves, we're not living with passion. We're not living with purpose. We're not living making disciples. We're not living being bold for Christ. We're just going through the motions. But God is saying to you today that I have more for you to do. God has more for you to do. God wants you to have hope again. God wants you to have faith again. Your best days aren't behind you. Your best days are ahead of you. That's a lie from the enemy. God takes us from glory to glory. He doesn't take us backwards. Some of us haven't seen the best that God has in store for us. God has so much in store for us to do for his kingdom and for his glory. But will we remember that he restores He restores dreams. Some of us have given up on dreams. He restores bodies. Some of us are dealing with sickness. And he restores lives. He restores souls. One of the greatest restorations of God's power is that he restores our souls. That he loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, He came to this earth and he lived a perfect life for you and I. He lived a perfect life and he went to the cross to die for you and I. And he didn't only go to the cross to die for you and I, but as he went into the grave, he did not stay in the grave. The word says that three days later he got up and he had all power and he had all authority in his hands. Is anybody thankful that we serve a living king? We serve a living savior. We serve somebody that restored our soul when we were hopeless. There was nothing in the earth earth, there's no money, there's no success, there's no friendship, there's no relationship, there's nothing that this earth can give you that can restore your soul except Jesus Christ. He restores our souls. And as we remember this, there are a couple things that we must practice. And as we think about this restoration, I want to leave you at 1 Peter 5 and 10 as well. It says, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory. By means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. Wow. Jesus Christ placed us on a firm foundation. 
For some of us, we've been on a shaky foundation. And we're wondering why we aren't experiencing God's restoration, why we aren't experiencing the best that God has for us. It's because we've been trying to do it on our own. We haven't been leaning into this truth that we find in Scripture that the God of the universe loves us so much that he restores our souls. He restores our brokenness. He restores things that seem impossible. You know what your dry bones are. And the word of the Lord today is that his fresh wind is coming to you. His firm foundation is coming to you. It's a couple quick things that we must practice that we can pull from this text. We must practice being available. If you want to experience God's fresh wind in your life, you must make yourself available to him. Ezekiel the prophet was available to God. So God takes him by the spirit and gives him this vision and then God restores the children of Israel. Are you available to God? Being available to God means that things might not go the way that you want them to go, but it's not about your will. It's about his will. It's about getting in his presence. It's about remembering his promises. We also must practice having faith. Do we trust God's character and his promises? When Ezekiel was asked, can these bones live again? He had enough faith to say, God, you know the answer. Do we have enough faith today to say, God, these dry bones can live again? I have faith. I still believe. I believe in your power. I believe in your presence. I believe in your purpose. I believe that the best days are ahead and not behind me. I believe that I am valuable because I am a child of God. I believe that you go with me every step of every day. I believe that I'm not by myself. I believe that the God of the universe is with me and he has my back. And if God be for me, no man can be against me. I believe that as I walk, I'm not walking trying to get victory. I'm walking from victory because the Lord that I serve has came and he has conquered sin, death, and hell. So every single battle that I face in life, I'm not facing that battle trying to get victory. I'm facing that battle knowing that I have already been given the victory through Christ Jesus. And I have faith. God wants to know, will you have faith to believe that those dry bones can live again? Will you have faith to believe that this city can be revived with the power of God and that the gospel is going to go out from this building and that people are going to be saved in your family, people are going to be saved at your job, restoration is going to happen. Everywhere we turn, we're going to see the Spirit of God falling out. Do you believe it? Do you have the faith for it? We also must practice being obedient. Ezekiel was obedient to God. God was like, prophesy. He prophesied. We must be obedient, church. Our job is obedience. God's responsibility is outcome. Some of us, we're so focused on the outcome that we're not living in obedience. We must live in the obedience of the Father because that's where the power lies. And the last thing that we must practice is being faithful. I love this text because God is like telling him to prophesy like four different times. (laughs) Prophesy, prophesy, prophesy. And he's faithful to it. One of the biggest lies that you might hear about Christianity is that Christianity is about this fame and this having fortune and having fame and just having a walk in the park and things just being easy. No, 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 no. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about being faithful. I want to see God and I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Some of us, that's what we need to lean into, God's faithfulness. He's saying, will you be faithful where you are? Will you be faithful despite the dry bones? Will you be faithful? Will you be faithful? So I don't know what your dry bones are today, but I do know that God's fresh wind is pouring out. And I don't want to miss it. And I don't want you to miss it. And I know some of us came to church today not knowing what to expect, but the presence of the living God is in this place right now. 
and God is moving on your souls and he's moving on your heart. Some of you, you don't know what you're feeling right now, but that's the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's ministering to you and he's letting you know that those dry bones are not too dry for me. I still have work for you to do. I still want more, so much more for you to do for my kingdom. But will you practice these things? As I get ready to close, one of my wife and I's favorite places to go on a vacation to is Miami. Anybody like Miami? Welcome to Miami. I love Miami. And I remember one of the times that we were there, what I love about going to the beach, from the time I was a child, I'll go to the beach and these waves would just come in. And like for me, it was a game. It was like the wave would come and I'll jump into the wave. And like to me, like if you go to the beach and you can't jump into the wave, it's like, what are you doing? So I was in Miami and I was in the water and this day, the water was still. And I saw somebody else kind of standing there also waiting for the waves. <laughs> I wasn't by myself. He was ready for the waves. He was like, yeah, I'm ready for these waves. But there was no waves. And he said, don't worry. The waves are going to come. And I said, how do you know the waves are going to come? He said, because I've seen the waves come before. And because I've seen the waves come before, I know that the waves are going to come again. And how do I know that God's spirit is pouring out? Because I've seen God's spirit pour out before. I've seen God's spirit poured out in the Old Testament. I've seen God's spirit poured out in the New Testament. I've seen God's spirit poured out in my own life. And the spirit is continuing to pour out today. But don't miss it. Don't miss it. There's a fresh wind of God's glory in here. There's a fresh wind of God's glory that wants to meet you where you are. But will you lean in to what he's doing? Will you lean in? Don't miss it. For some of us, leaning in means signing up for a small group. (laughs) You know, because we've been trying to do this on our own. Today's a perfect day. You can make a practical step. Say, I'm not going to miss this fresh wind. I'm going to sign up for a group in the lobby. I don't know what that step looks like for you, but whatever that step is, I want to encourage you to take it today and to remember that there's a fresh wind of God that's available for us if we just tap in and receive it. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you so much for who you are. I pray right now, dear Lord God, as we get ready to close, that there's anybody in here, and you're being 100% honest You might be far from God today. Maybe fear is in the way, but I have great news for you. You're just one prayer away from being closer to him. Some of us have not even experienced the initial fresh wind of God with our souls being restored. And today is your day of salvation. So if that's you, James 4 and 8 says that as we draw near to God, there's a promise. He will draw near to you. Romans chapter 3 tells us, for everyone has sinned. You're not by yourself. I know that the enemy wants to make you think that you're the worst person to ever walk the earth. But no, we all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Yet God freely makes us right in his sight as people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus died for us. So if you're here today, today is your day of salvation. You want to begin a relationship with God. Now is your chance. As all heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just simply want to lead you in a prayer. And I pray, please, 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 don't miss out on God's fresh wind. If you know that you've been running, today is the day where you surrender and you experience this fresh wind that I'm talking about. Will you repeat after me? Today, God, I give you my life. I recognize that I can't do this on my own that I am in need of a Savior. I believe that Jesus died and rose again for me. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for trying to live on my own. And give me the power to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, stay focused on prayer with me just one quick moment as I pray for everyone. 
Lord, I thank you so much for this word, this prophetic word that you've given me. I believe and I know with all my heart, Lord, that everyone that's watching this, everyone that's here in the room, that this is not a coincidence, that that you, Lord, order their footsteps to be here to remind them that there is fresh wind, that there's a fresh move of your spirit pouring out on the earth. And no matter how dry their situation might be, that you are a God that restores. So I pray for your spirit to be with them even as they leave this place. I pray for the word that they experience today to be eternally sealed in their hearts, minds, and souls for the rest of eternity. It's in Jesus' name we pray.